Another beautiful Tuesday here at the Off the Bench podcast. Brandon Carney alongside Maddie Kroll. Maddie, how are you doing this fine morning? Oh, I'm just thriving. How are you? Just thriving. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Look, I start pretty much every podcast off at this point with a little bit of homerism. Uh, Not so much my pro teams, but my college team. UConn men's basketball, as of today, our recording date of Monday, number three team in the country. So, listen, I'm having a great time. College basketball, really the only sport in my life that even holds a candle to the NFL. Um, I don't have a podcast for college basketball, so you guys got to bear with me. Let me flex a little bit in the first minute or so. You guys are stuck. I'm just having a great time. Yeah, you guys are stuck. I mean, we still have the UConn Santa hat over there, just buried a little bit. But, uh, yeah, UConn's doing great. I'm thriving. But that's not what we're here for. We are here to talk some football. And Maddie, there's actually a little bit of news right before we got on, which is not a surprise considering we record these on, you know, Monday afternoons right after a full NFL Sunday. T.Y. Hilton has signed with the Dallas Cowboys. Now, this is super interesting because, as we know, the Dallas Cowboys have been one of the main teams rumored for Odell Beckham Jr. Maddie, what do you make of this move? Um, Do you think this is a, a response to the near win over near loss to the Texans? Do you think this is a instead of Odell move? Do you think they're still in on Odell? What, what does this mean to you right off the bat? I think because Jerry Jones is Jerry Jones, you have to think that they're still in on Odell. But I this makes me feel like maybe Odell's having second thoughts and is considering somewhere else, especially yeah. after uh, the Cowboys game yesterday. Well, listen. That's fair. But if you look at the other teams that Odell is considering, we've heard the Giants, who this isn't a surprise because I don't know why he's considering them to begin with, but they got blown out by the Eagles. So I don't think he's like, ah, I don't know, the Cowboys, maybe I should go home to New York. They got smacked. Uh, so again, we've talked about it a million times. Don't think they're going to ultimately make the playoffs. And then you've got the Bills, who, I mean, pretty good performance, weird, bad weather in that game, managed to pull out a win against the Jets. So I also don't know if week to week is what's swaying where Odell wants to go, but it is interesting. I I don't think this affects whether or not they get Odell. Um, T.Y. Hilton is a guy that is firmly, firmly a depth piece. I mean, there's a reason he's been floating around, you know, in free agency this long. The only reason Mm -hmm. Odell was is because he was recovering from injury, so it wasn't worth signing him before this. T.Y. Hilton's been healthy. Um, He's just he's way past his prime. I think he's just kind of this bench deep threat that they're going to employ occasionally. Uh, but I mean, he's signing on to be wide receiver four. Uh, you would assume behind Gallup, CD lamb and Noah Brown. And uh, then Odell can still come into the mix. T Y Hilton going to the Cowboys just feels like a ring chase. And it's the Cowboys are like, all right, we need a little bit of depth. Uh, you want to come here? Cause even if you don't play at all, like we might win a super bowl. So that's really all I'm taking from it. I don't think it means too, too much on the Odell front. Whenever I saw that to me, I kind of thought, okay, this is the Cowboys' way of trying to settle Dak a little bit in the pocket. I think that we'll probably see Dak out of empty going forward with this Mm -hmm. setup. Yeah, yeah, it'll definitely – it can change the dynamic of the offense. will be be interesting to see um, if and when Odell makes this decision. At this point, I'm not convinced he actually signs anywhere. So (laughs) who knows? Um, The other big – we'll get to the actual storylines from Sunday. So number one in my eyes, without a question – is the Brock party that we've got going Brock on. So Brock Purdy with an amazing performance after sub- subbing in for Jimmy G last game uh, goes head to head with another late round quarterback. I had a tweet yesterday that I was like, how lucky are we that we get to see the greatest late round quarterback turned unanimous hall of famer up mm. against Tom Brady. I mean, how lucky are we, but it is super exciting to see Brock play like this. And it just kind of reaffirms what, I said when Jimmy first went down, which is I don't think this changes much for San Francisco. And now I'm not convinced that they're not better with Brock Purdy. What do you make of this game? I feel the exact same way. I mean, some of that is just because you have new players that are integrating meshing. You know, CMC went off and did his CMC things. Um, But, no, I completely agree with you. I almost feel like – I feel like Purdy is obviously more mobile. He's able to, he's more of a second reaction quarterback than what you're going to get out of Jimmy G. So going forward into next season, I feel like, you know, this is still Trey Lance's team. They spent the money on him, but there might be a little bit of a quarterback battle. And I feel like Jimmy G, his time with the 49ers is done. And maybe we'll see him with the Jets. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, what you what called? I, yeah. That's what I was going to say next is it, it really brings the Trey Lance and Jimmy G futures into question, right? Because yeah. you've got Jimmy who I think is 
probably decidedly gone now that the 49ers know they at least have a good back mm-hmm. like Brock Purdy to turn to if they do, in fact, go into next year with Trey Lance as their starter. But, like, I'm looking at this and thinking, okay, if Brock Purdy looks this good for the rest of the season, and let's say he goes to the playoffs, wins a couple games, let's say he wins the Super Bowl with these 49ers, do the Niners look to trade Trey Lance and recoup some of the picks that they may have lost to acquire Christian McCaffrey? Or I don't know, just just to really turn the keys over to Purdy. Cause like I understand that's a that's a best case scenario for Brock and the 49ers is that things just go flawlessly from now until the end of the season. But mm-hmm. if Brock really does pull that kind of season, what do you do? Like it's you have Trey Lance who you invested so much in, but has also shown you nothing to this point. So it's just a really tough situation for them to be in. I mean, a situation that I'm sure a lot of teams would like to be in where they have yeah, I was say. options at quarterback, but mm-hmm. it makes it it makes it tough because you don't want to have to look back, you know, three years from now and be like, oh shit, we made the wrong decision. Like Brock is really just a backup caliber quarterback and Trey is shining in Carolina or whatever, wherever the hell they end up sending him if they did trade him. I was gonna say where would you envision Trey Lance? Because that's the issue is no one's seen what he can do. So he's still right. a quarterback with a question mark. And even if you go back to when he was being drafted, there's a lot of toss up with him falling back because nobody really knew what to expect. And when that happened, I said, this is the perfect spot for him. I can't imagine him being as successful on any other team, just the type of quarterback that he is. And so I just don't know that you're going to have a ton of people knocking down the door. Jimmy G, I think there's a lot of teams that could take him because you know what you're getting with him. He's has a proven track record and he's going to be cheap, right? So at this point, I think you're even honestly uh, getting more out of Brock Purdy than you are Trey Lance, just because nobody knows what to expect. And he's going to come with a higher price tag. Yeah. I I just think it, it becomes super interesting if you do head into next season with both so like I said, say the 49ers win the Super Bowl, a Super Bowl winning Brock Purdy, and then a young quarterback that you traded three first round picks for. It's like, who it's do wild. you start and do you trade one of them? So I have no idea. It's a little early to be talking Trey Lance trade scenarios. I mean, this is one game for Brock against a Buccaneers team that's been reeling for most of the year, but it, it gets those conversations started because you've got, of course, people don't wait. You've already got the Tom Brady comparisons for Brock, yeah. the late round quarterback that, you know, looks better than anybody thought. Um, I mean, he, hell, he looks better than any rookie quarterback taken in this draft. So, and I don't even think it's particularly close so far. So we will see. Um, the other quarterback in this game, again, Tom Brady. I don't know what to make of Tom Brady right now because he had, he had some really awful throws in this game. And, you know, mm-hmm. I think everybody expected the 49ers to win this game, even with Brock at the helm, just because of the defense and the weapons that they have. I don't know that anybody pegged a blowout like this and for Brady to look this outright bad. Forget the defense. Forget how quality of players San Francisco has on that side of the ball. Brady was flat out missing throws often. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you make of that? Is this this just a one-off game? Is this the start of an actual decline that we've been waiting to see for literally a decade from this guy? Or, Or what do we make of this? You know, I think that we're kind of seeing a little bit of a decline. I think that one thing that like caught my attention last week during the game, not week 14, week 13, is he comes off and they're in that two-minute drill situation. It's the last play, and he comes to his play caller, and they say, what do you want to do? I feel like this man is having to not only play quarterback, lead the team, he's also a play caller. He is giving advice on defense, you see. Um, I think that he's just a man who's pouring himself in so many different buckets and then you add his personal life on top of that. It's it's a lot. And then his age, obviously his body's not keeping up as well. And I think that we're just starting to see that natural decline that you would expect to see in a quarterback, this quarterback like 10 years ago, honestly, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that it's just par for the course. You know, he doesn't have the weapons around him. And I think that this is kind of what we should expect for the rest of the season from Tom Brady. Yeah, as a Patriots fan, I mean, I can tell you how long the the decline conversation has been going on. It's been going on this long. I remember when Pats fans were convinced that Ryan Mallett was the next man up. And that's and that's not even to say, oh, Ryan Mallett was terrible. So obviously he wasn't. It's just you remember how long ago Ryan Mallett was drafted? Yeah, it was a while back. 
So the fact that he was looked at as, oh, maybe, you know, whenever Brady retires, they hand it over to Ryan Mallett. I was in high school when that happened. I, I don't even remember those conversations happening. Oh, man. It's just whenever they drafted a young quarterback behind Brady, once Brady hit his 30s, it was like it became a thing. And I was like, you know, and I bought into it, too, because I'm like, you know, you expect a normal yeah. human quarterback to start declining once your age starts with a three, at least a little bit. But mm -hmm. uh, not Tommy. We're, we may be starting to see it now. I'll be curious to see where what he does this offseason. It sounds like retirement isn't super high up on his option, uh, on his option list. Um, yeah. So just a matter of is he going to stay in Tampa Bay? It seems like it's not trending that way either. So I'm not sure what's next for Tom. I'm wondering if the if the New England rumors have any weight to them. I do think that everybody has to kind of keep in mind this was a short week as well. So mm -hmm. that kind of plays into it. But yeah, I think that everybody's starting to have fun with the TB in 23 conversation and where he's going to end up, what's going to happen. Yeah, um, I've, I'm not going to make any guesses or any predictions because every time I do, it's wrong. So that, that's totally fair, but leave it to Tom Brady to be age 45 and still be the center of attention for an NFL offseason because he's going to be yeah. once we hit this offseason for sure. Um, the other thing to note for this game was Debo Samuel's injury mm. looked pretty scary when it first happened. Um, at the same time, watching that injury, I was like, man, he got bent up pretty bad at the same time. It didn't seem like anything really snapped the wrong way, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So I was yeah. hopeful. Ultimately, it does sound like he avoided a worst case scenario. Uh, we're looking at high ankle sprain four weeks or so uh, should be back by the playoffs at the very least. So 49ers dodging a bullet there. The other quarterback who made some major headlines, this one, we're throwing it back to Thursday. Maddie, we talked a lot of trash about this game. No, we sure did. It, heading into it on our little live stream, which if you guys have yet to tune into every Thursday, half hour before kickoff, tune in. It's Thursday so much Easter. fun. It yeah. is a lot of fun. It's, it's literally just a half hour of answering you guys' questions. So if you're want to interact with us, come on through, but we were talking about, the Rams Raiders game. And we were like, there is really nothing interesting about this game other than seeing Baker's debut, which we did not expect much from lo and behold, Baker Mayfield leads a 98 yard game winning touchdown drive in his first game as a Ram two days to prepare. There's no way this man memorized more than a page of the Rams playbook in that time. And yet he comes out and has literally his best game of the season. Like you look at his game logs with any game of the Panthers, this was his best game of the year. I'm fascinated. I'm disappointed in the Raiders because, guys, what are we doing allowing that to happen? Uh, but, Baker, what do you think is next for him and the Rams as we look ahead to next season? Do you think Baker is going to maybe stick around and be a high-level backup for this team? Or, I mean, hell, if he keeps playing at this level, you think he's going to earn himself a starting job somewhere? I think we kind of talked about this a little bit on Thursday prior to the Baker Mayfield having a night type thing. Um, I'm concerned that Stafford's going to want to come back. The man's won a Super Bowl, and that injury that he's going to have to come back from is so tough. Anytime you have anything that has to do with a back, and I believe now his the spinal cord is involved in some way on the surgery, I, I – I'm not going to pretend to be a doctor. Either way, it sounds like it's going to be pretty gnarly to come back from. Mm -hmm. I think that <clears throat> Baker Mayfield has a really great shot at staying with the Rams. He has a relationship with Sean McVay. And Baker is a loyal guy and will run through a wall if he feels like he has mutual respect there. He hasn't had that. I mean, the man's had more coaches in five years than I've had even boyfriends at this point. It's <laughs> unbelievable. And – he is a resilient guy, but I do think that, you know, he has his, he has his moments, right? McVay knows how to game plan exactly to Baker Mayfield's strengths. And then it's obvious that within a day's time, he's won the entire locker room. I mean, when he got that game ball, the locker room went insane for him. And that just tells you a lot. So I think that he has a good shot, a good shot at staying in LA if he can um, continue what, he did this past week. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, I'm just excited to see Baker sort of succeeding. You know, I've been one of the bigger Baker fans most of his career just because I loved the persona. I love the swag. I love everything about it. The fact that he managed to take the Browns back to the playoffs um, just to clean up some things with Stafford, just for what we should expect for him going forward. So the Rams shut him down for the year. Um, the latest report was they expect him to make a full recovery through rest and rehab this off season without surgery and his recent, his contract he just signed was four years, $160 million, and he signed that this past March. So as of now, 
no real reason to expect retirement or anything like that from Stafford unless things turn yeah. the wrong direction. Um, but look, that is a scary injury. I could totally see if there were no teams um, willing to give Baker a starting opportunity that he sticks on and just is one of the best, hopefully one of the best backup quarterbacks in the league. Great insurance policy for the Rams who are going to be looking to compete again next year once everybody gets healthy. I do have a conspiracy theory on this topic if you want to hear oh, it. Oh, let me hear it. Okay, so when Baker was transferring into OU, obviously he was walking on. Mm -hmm. He did everything he possibly could to set himself up for success. At the time, he wasn't allowed to have the playbook yet before he was transferring in. That man went through hours and hours and hours of film by himself and broke down everything. He had a conversation with McVay prior to this whole situation before mm -hmm. him even being traded to the Panthers. Um, and they had a conversation on the plane. I think he knew that McVay was interested in him. It's just they already had the quarterback, right? Mm -hmm. So Stafford goes down, and I think Baker saw his opportunity. He said he booked his flight prior to even hitting the waivers. He said that he kind of took yeah. a risk there. I sneaky feel like he either – there's a there's a player I know that he's very, very close with. He either got his hands on the playbook knowing that he was going to make his way there or he did the sneaky Baker stuff. And I do think that he's more prepared than what people are leading on. Obviously, we'll never know the true answer. But I think there's a lot of that going on underneath. This is something that he really wants. His wife, Emily, loves to be in L.A. He loves to be in L.A. Mm -hmm. um, so I just really think that he's going to do whatever it takes to stay there. And hey, listen, I don't think that conspiracy theory is too crazy. The only thing I do want to say is if that is true about the playbook, maybe got his hands on it early. Regardless, that's still like five days to prep because he yeah, only, no, he only got crazy. waived like five days ahead of the game. So either way, yeah. that is a, a tough, tough turnaround. And he looked incredible. So Baker may have a question that, for you, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. OK, so what does this mean for McDaniels? Because we thought that oh, after yeah. last week it meant, okay, McDaniels is obviously their guy. They're going to stick behind him. Do you think that this changes anything? Because now he's lost to a coach who was an analyst the week before, and then you have a quarterback who is playing for a different team two days before that comes in and beats you. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was listening back to our podcast from last week where I was kind of going through the Raiders rest of season schedule and just mm -hmm. what McDaniels could do to prove himself. And so obviously the first game on that was the Rams. And what I had said was, you know, the Rams are in such shambles that it doesn't even matter. Like this, this game doesn't matter as far as McDaniels resume going forward. That's because in my head, I was like, the Raiders are going to win that game. No matter what, what I should have I said was, that, yeah. what I should have said was it matters a lot because if they were to lose, that is embarrassing to a high degree. And that's exactly what happened. So I, I don't think like this has, you know, closed, closed the coffin on McDaniel's career just yet. But like, this is definitely, you know, he had a chance to keep sort of ownership's eyes off of him for a couple more weeks. Um, I think they're firmly back on him now. Like, I don't know how you lose that game. I really don't. I said in our pregame show, I said in our podcast, they need Raiders needed to win that game and win it decisively. They did not even win it. So McDaniel's, it's up and down for him. He had this nice little win streak, and now you lose to, I mean, arguably the worst team in football. So it's it's not great. It doesn't reflect well on McDaniels at all. Yeah, I agree. So Baker Mayfield, we will see what the future holds for him. I am excited. I hope that you know he sticks around. It is encouraging to see at the very least that he's not XFL bound, at least. Not yeah. yet. It doesn't seem so. We'll be seeing him around the NFL, whether it's a starting job or not. Who knows? Now – on to, you got Stafford, we got a connection here to Jared Goff, and Jared Goff Man. led the Lions to quite a win, and mm -hmm. we can hit the music here from our, our producer, he, he's got something queued up, um, this is the Viking funeral, the Lions, black. the Lions came into this game actually favored by two points, facing a team that we were worried might be a little bit fraudulent compared to their 10 and two record and they won and they covered and they won pretty decisively. They had that Pene Sewell catch to ice it at the end. And I just, you know, I'm being dramatic with the Viking funeral thing. The Vikings are not dead. They're sitting there 10 and three and are going to win their division clearly. But I feel like this firmly takes them out of being serious Super Bowl contenders as of right now. It's like, 
you need to not leave any doubt with games like this, Maddie. What, what was your takeaway from the Lions holding down the fort in this game? I think that it is telling more about the Vikings. Man, the Lions are just a tough team because they they don't stop right? No matter what situation they are in, they're going to run through a wall and continue to play. Um, It makes me excited for the Lions. The Vikings, I just, I really don't know what to make of them at this point because we've seen them do crazy, amazing things. And then you see them fall down. Now they were, they were down their center, their left tackle. And I think one other, um, offensive lineman. So that makes a big difference, especially whenever you have a quarterback who's not really a second reaction quarterback. I think that that made a huge difference, but still, I mean, Justin Jefferson went off. I really just, the Vikings defense just shit the bed. I don't know what else to say. Like there's really no other analytics you can say. And that's the thing. And that's a theme, right? Like going into this game, we knew the Lions offense really shouldn't be a surprise to anybody anymore. They, They are elite on the offensive side of the ball, genuinely like a top 10 team in the league in terms of offense. We knew that both teams' defenses were pretty bad. This is what sets the Vikings apart in a bad way from the other elite teams in the NFC. There are so many elite defenses in the NFC that are going to be able to neutralize this Vikings offense to an extent, while the Vikings are not going to be able to do the same to the team that they're facing. Like you've got the Cowboys. You got the Cowboys, the Eagles, the 49ers. Those might be the three best defenses in the NFL. They're all in the NFC. Like the Vikings have this record and still no one's scared of them. And this is why, like you have the Lions just beating up on them. So I I don't know what, I don't know what to make of it with, with the Vikings other than they don't scare me right now. Um, No, they don't. Some notes on the Lions. So we had this funny stat a few weeks ago where, the Bills were the first team to win back-to-back games at Ford Field since 2016 when they had to have their game against the Browns move to Ford Field due to weather, and then they won against the Lions in Ford Field. Well, the Lions said, listen, that's kind of embarrassing. We're going to fix that. So the Lions have now won back-to-back games at Ford Field for the first time since a couple weeks ago. Regardless, nice of them to uh, uh, get that get that stat kind of put away. Um, Jamison Williams. Talk about him a little bit. If he becomes a factor in this offense, it just makes them another level of elite. He didn't really do a whole lot in this game. I mean, it was a broken play. He scored a touchdown on his first reception ever, but it just goes to show you like, they're like, Hey, don't forget. We got this guy over here. Once we start giving him more snaps, he gets more comfortable. Good luck because him and Amon Ross St. Brown in the same offense, you have DJ Chark, who's still playing at a high level in the receiving game. You got a good running game who actually they didn't get much from in this one and they still won it handily. So I don't know. This, this Lions offense is scary. And I've, I said this on yesterday, like any team that faces this Lions team in the playoffs, should they get there in the first round is not going to be happy. Like this is a frightening team. This is an offense that can hang with absolutely anybody. And it just feels ripe for like a, like a Cowboys upset or something like that. And, yeah. and I, I just, I want to see this Lions team get to the playoffs. It is more than possible. We'll talk a little bit later about, um, what the playoff picture is looking like right now, but the lions are right there. They were one of my dark horses last week. And I'm excited that, you know, they kind of put this one away. Just hope that they take care of business the rest of the way in games that are, you know, the rest of their games are on paper easier than the Vikings was. So they could. And now win. we know that they have a coach with kahunas, the size of Texas. Oh man. That soul play made me so excited. So excited. So that, that play was incredible. And then you also had the fake punt in the third the quarter where they were up 14 to seven it was fourth and yep. seven on their own 30 yard line. And they, they went with the fake punt. I love when a coach has the guts to do stuff like that. I, you just, you do worry if he's going to get too cute at some point when it counts, right? Like it, we're looking at this and we're like, this is amazing. Cause it worked. Um, right. This kind of throw into the O lineman thing. We were, hammering the Packers for trying something similar. Granted, it was in the end zone a few weeks ago. So it's one of those things. It's a little hindsighty where it's like, if it works, holy shit, you're a genius. If it doesn't, dude, what are you doing? That's not necessary. Honestly, talking a little more about the fake punt at this point, because if that didn't work, they're going to be on, you know, their other side of the field, um, short field for the Vikings and they could have tied it up. But yeah, I I think it's a fine line to walk, but Dan Campbell, if nothing else is pure entertainment, on a week to week basis. And I think it's kind of the mindset you have to have when you have a team that is 
borderline playoffs. Like, what do you what do you have to lose, really? So you know, and like that's they all have heart. They're going for it to get a tackle to line up as a tight end. Do you know how exciting that is? Yeah. He was probably losing his mind. Oh yeah. We um, love seeing the O-line and get some love in the receiving game every once in a while. Yeah, and it just kind of brings the whole team together. So they have that going for them. And I really want – I want the Lions to do well the rest of the season because I think Dan Campbell needs to be able to stay there and continue to cultivate um, this team that he's already – he started with. I think that they need to let him see it through. And I'm worried that if the Lions tank – then it's not going to happen. So I really want to see Dan Campbell at least get one more season under his belt. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there was one other report that came out after this game that I thought was interesting. It wasn't really even a conversation I had heard much about lately, but Ian Rappaport reported that the Lions do not consider Jared Goff to be a bridge quarterback. I found that interesting because I think in the back of my head, I kind of thought he was a little bit. I mean, Jared Goff has been playing well this year. Um, but one of those things where, you know, you're kind of always, you assume the team is looking out of the corner of their eye, seeing if a better option is going to become available, or if there's a guy in the draft that maybe they can groom and let sit behind golf. Cause he's a decent mentor for that kind of thing, just with how he's playing. Uh, but it seems like golf is their guy and, and I'm happy for Jared Goff. He's playing really, really well. And if he can keep stringing games together like this, maybe it will be the guy that, you know, coming out of Cal was supposed to be elite and looking back at the him and Carson Wentz conversation is wild, but you know, supposed to be this elite guy alongside Carson Wentz, maybe Goff can mm-hmm. actually be a top 12, top 10 quarterback if things keep trending this direction. So I'm glad they're committing to him as long as this report rings true. And uh, if they keep playing like this, why wouldn't they? Um, speaking of quarterbacks had a game last night that has drawn mm-hmm. up quite a bit of discussion. Justin Herbert, Outdueled Tua Tonga Vailoa in a pretty solid game, Chargers Dolphins. There's just been a lot of discussion between these two because they were picked in the same draft right near each other. And the conversation has long been okay, Herbert has the more physical tools. He, you know, can make throws that nobody else can make. But Tua, especially this season, is playing better. Maddie, did you draw any conclusions from this game about the two quarterbacks? And I'll put you on the spot. Next 10 years, who would you rather have, Tua or Herbert? And this isn't like buying stock in them because obviously one is kind of in a better offensive situation than the other. That's kind of the crux of the Mm -hmm. argument. But you're building a team. Who would you rather have, Tua or Herbert? I'd rather have Herbert. I mean, the things that we've watched him do, not just this season, the seasons before, he masks everything that's wrong with that offensive line. They essentially have no offensive line right now before – he was running from his right side. Then your star left tackle goes down. You have a rookie there. um, And then you have another injury to your guard. And so he's basically doing this with no offensive line. And you couldn't really tell a difference. He's making insane, just insane situations out of nothing. He is extending plays and that's exactly what you want from a quarterback. And then he can make throws on top of that. I love Tua and I'm rooting for Tua, but like you said, he has the tools around him and This season, he has gotten the ball off a little bit quicker, and that's great for him. It's just I think that his ceiling is kind of what we've seen this season, and Herbert has so much more to give. You know, Tua has all the tools around him. What was interesting to me, though, is I we haven't seen anybody face the Dolphins and man this season defensively, Mm -hmm. and the Chargers did it over 50% of the snaps. They were in man defense. Do you know how crazy that is to face man against Waddle and Tyreek yeah. Hill? I mean, unbelievable. That's ballsy. And, yeah, but and I, I mean, I understand that Tyreek Hill wasn't at his best, and that does make a difference. But it was ballsy, and I really respect the Chargers for that. Yeah, I, I think the the Tua Herbert conversation. It's funny to me how much people will ignore context when things like this happen. You've got Tua who, you know, I will first of all admit that I was wrong on him. He's playing better than I expected, regardless of the weapons that he has. So Tua is a good quarterback. He'll be around this league for a long time. But, like, so many people were jumping Tua over Herbert in their rankings and stuff like that, as if they didn't add Tyreek Hill in the offseason, as if they didn't add a head coach who, by all accounts, is one of the smartest and best young coaches in the NFL. Mike McDaniel's a legend. Um, It's like, what... What better situation could Tua have been put in? Yes, he's performing within that situation, but like, I don't know how you just act like Tua is suddenly better and ignore all of the great things that they've brought to him while Herbert is kind of suffering with 
yeah. left. Well, they even if you just look at strictly the offensive line, they brought in they brought in the Chargers, one of the Chargers offensive line coaches to take yeah. over the Dolphins offensive line. And they added in multiple uh, assistant coaches just to develop the offensive line so that Tua could have a little bit more success. They invested in the trenches. Um, so you would expect him to be a little bit higher. If you're asking me fantasy wise who I would take, that might be a little bit different course, story just because course. like, you know, he's set up to be a little bit more successful. But I 100 percent agree with you in the fact that I think that Herbert gets a bad rep just because he doesn't have the same tools around him. But he's doing the same thing that Patrick Mahomes is doing. It's just he doesn't get noticed for it because he either doesn't have anybody to throw to or they're not completing the passes. If Justin Herbert were on this Dolphins team and played every game, I'm not sure they would have lost a game to this point. I agree with that. I, I, Herbert, imagining a Herbert to Tyreek Hill connection literally just makes me want to explode. Like that sounds amazing because we've seen seen it with Mahomes and Hill. Herbert has a similar arm. If not, mm -hmm. I mean, Mahomes himself has been like, Herbert can make throws that I can't make. Whether that's yeah. just him being nice or not, I mean, it's not far off of the truth, even if it is a little off the truth. Yeah. So. Well, Mahomes is risky, but uh, Herbert just sees things before they happen, and he gets the ball off so much faster than what Mahomes does. Mahomes is solely like a second reaction type guy where he's making throws on his way down that's just like whatever you want to call that little hook shot mm -hmm. throw that he did this weekend. Yeah. But Herbert sees, yeah, Herbert sees things before they happen, and he's getting the ball off quick. He knows when he's scrambling out of the pocket, I'm going to go here so I can dump the ball off there. It's very – methodical and very quick with it and that's why i think that people think he's a better token thrower than mm -hmm. mahomes is yeah i think um you know to his decision making has been pretty good this year and he's looked again a lot better than i thought he would but we haven't Herbert, seen anybody he hasn't had to face anybody in man everybody's been scared yeah of him. i think that yeah. was the difference and it shut him down yeah i he think Herbert is, herbert's just the better quarterback and, and we'll mm -hmm. see that over the next few years and i think this game did a little bit to kind of remind people that, you know, Tua's, Tua has his limitations that Herbert doesn't necessarily have, but Tua is still, he's doing pretty much everything you could have asked him to do with the weapons he's been provided, except, you know, beat the Chargers last night. So I do have one question before we move on, and I know this is supposed to be quick, but the Dolphins do face the Bills this weekend. Yeah. After what we saw that happened with the Dolphins Chargers, do you feel like the Bills are going to go a little bit more man? Because we know their coordinator enjoys doing that some. I feel like that's how you stop them. Yeah, I mean, I don't see why not, right? Like you you can at least have that be the strategy in the first half. And if, if mm -hmm. Tyreek Hill is burning you all the way up and down the field, then you can adjust. But, you know, you've seen this is, I think, like the lowest yardage output passing yard wise for Tua, maybe all season. Um, so if you feel like, you know, the Chargers have found the formula, you might as well try it. It's not like the Chargers are – super super loaded in the secondary anymore jc jackson down for the year he wasn't playing great before anyway but like so. they're the way they're playing um yeah i think if, if they found a way to neutralize those that receiving core which is probably the best in the league uh you might as well try and mimic it it's a copycat league we know that much so yeah that's true yeah so we will see how the bills handle this one against the dolphins and it'll be an interesting game for sure because now the dolphins are going to feel like they have something to prove which in fairness they probably they do. do and so, so do the bills <laughs> Yeah. So, all right. Tua was a guy who was briefly in the MVP conversation. He may have unfortunately played himself out of it, at least for now. A guy who is not playing himself out of it and is playing himself very much possibly back into being the favorite right now. Jalen Hurts and the Eagles dominated the Giants. I, I mean, what more do we have to say about the Eagles than they are the best team in football and should be the clear Super Bowl favorites? They're dominating in the trenches. That's all. That's all you can say. Their defensive line now is getting after it, as well as their offensive line. We know is just oh, impeccable. Oh, <laughs> you recognize that? You know what that was? We were wondering. I sure do. For those listening at home or those watching who are confused, that is the Eagles' offensive line and their Christmas album. A brief mm -hmm. excerpt from it. So. Lane Johnson, Jordan Mailata, and Jason Kelsey. And damn it, they deserve a Grammy. I, I will die on that hill. If you're not going to allow Jason Kelsey to win an MVP, this man deserves a Grammy. Get these get these men a Grammy and a Lombardi in the same year. Mm. I, I don't think it's out of the question. 
Um, so the NFC East, very different outcomes for the two <laughs> juggernaut teams in this division, right? Eagles blow out the Giants. Mm-hmm. The Cowboys nearly lost to the Texans. Mm-hmm. I have no idea what to think about this because the Texans are, you know, I mentioned how the Rams might, might've been the worst team in football heading into that game. The Texans are the one that if you kind of pulled the masses, they'd be like, Oh yeah, that's the worst team in the league. They were one 10 and one coming into that game. Correct. What happened here? Why was this even remotely close? I think everybody in the world was wondering the same thing, but it's the Cowboys doing Cowboys things. Honestly, I, I don't know what else to say about it. There's no way it should have been that close. The Texans even had a majority of their starters that were down on the injury report. So what do you even say to this? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the Texans employed, you know, a different strategy in this game. Jeff Driscoll had a ton of playing time despite, you know, coming into the game. Davis Mills was named the starter, which was a change mm-hmm. from Kyle Allen previously being the starter uh, the couple of games before that. So maybe the Texans just caught the Cowboys off guard here at the very least. And, you know, maybe this is a strategy that will work for the Texans to be more competitive here down the stretch. Uh, but yeah, it just feels like a very Cowboys thing, right? Where they sometimes play down to the level of their opponent and maybe looked past the Texans here in this game. Because, I I mean, this wasn't supposed to be close by any stretch of the imagination. The spread was like 17 points or something ridiculous. And this is supposed to be one of the best, if not the best team in the NFL. Some people believe they are better than the Eagles. Um, I feel like that crowd has probably dwindled since this game. But, yeah, just a weird one for the Cowboys and more signs of the chaos that is probably to come. Um, that, that's what I was going to say. It's going to be more life. interesting to me to see what happens next because you have Terrence Steele, which I know is kind of a hot topic with Cowboys fans. A lot of people don't like him, but he has honestly been playing really well, especially with what they're asking him to do in slide protection. If he doesn't come back, it's going to change up the entire offensive line once again, which they've already had. They've had to continue to shovel. And for me, whenever I'm evaluating Dak, that's a big reason why the offense hasn't been as successful is because he bails out of the pocket before he even can get through most of his progressions, right? Mm -hmm. We have Tony Pollard, who's just going off. But I don't know if you remember that last little uh, touchdown where he – I think Dak went through four progressions before he saw Pollard. That was the very first time I watched him go through his entire progression set. Up until that point, he won't stay in the pocket long enough, and then he doesn't make good decisions when he's scrambling and trying to do things. He just doesn't see the field as well. And I don't know if that's from fear of being injured in the past and not wanting to happen again, but I can guarantee you if Terrence still doesn't come back and they do that offensive line musical chairs again, we're going to watch him digress a little bit more. Yeah, I think if you have any level of separation between the Eagles and the Cowboys or you're trying to nitpick what makes one better than the other, to me it's it's the quarterback position and it's Jalen Hurts over Dak Prescott mm-hmm. right now. Like Jalen Hurts is playing at such an absurdly elite level. And I just think if you if if you have to find a difference between these two and what will make one team be favored over the other, one team to beat the other uh come playoff time. It's, it's Jalen Hurts because he's been a monster. I'm, I'm just looking in Dex rushing numbers here a little bit to see what has actually declined from previous years. And it's mm-hmm. basically everything, as you would expect. Um, so Dak's first three years in the league had basically around 300 rushing yards every year, six touchdowns in each of those three years on the ground. Um, this year, you know, we are – he's played eight games in fairness only, 94 rushing yards and one rushing touchdown. So – Clearly, there's less of a willingness to run. We figured as much with the injuries that he has suffered, the ankle injury. Um, but meanwhile, Jalen is just motoring up and down the field with his legs every Sunday, in addition to being right. an elite passer. So, yeah. And I, I, I also think- feel like the play calling is a little bit more advanced on the Eagle side of the ball. Obviously, they can game manage a little bit better than what the Cowboys have proven that they can do in the past. So I just at this point feel like it's not even a competition. Yeah, so those were the three teams in the NFC East that actually played this week. Cowboys, Giants, and the Eagles. Eagles dominating the Giants, those two playing each other. So we just wanted to check in with that division because it's been one of the most interesting divisions this year. Again, as we sit right here right now, all four of them are in the playoffs still somehow because the Seahawks lost to the Panthers, whatever. Mm. Um, We had a team that has disappointed us basically all year. Disappoint us a little bit less this past week. Broncos country. We tried. So the Broncos showed Broncos some signs country. of life. 
That's right. right. Broncos showed some signs of life. Most points they've scored all season. Unfortunately for them, they decided to do that against the Kansas City Chiefs of all teams and, you know, make it so they were unlikely to win the game regardless. Chiefs did give them some chances, though. Mm -hmm. I was optimistic – not optimistic. I was happy to see Russell Wilson show a little bit of what we used to see in Seattle, which was sort of that confidence pushing the ball down the field. That connection with Jerry Judy was impressive for the time that Russ was in the game. Uh, Russ was actually running a little bit in this one too. So, you know, maybe this, maybe this billion dollar contract isn't going to be a complete waste. I think this is all we can hope for, for the rest of the year is just for them to show some signs of life and make fans believe that they are not completely screwed for the next five years that they have to pay this guy. Cause they also, the Broncos also got officially eliminated from playoff contention in this game. Not that we thought they were going to make it anyway, but maybe that's just something a weight off their shoulders now that they can be like, all right, guys, we are obviously mathematically looking forward to next season. Now we can play maybe a little looser, um, try and find some things to work for next year. Granted the head coach will probably not be the same next year. So who knows whether that's going to be worth it or not, but it was nice to see this from the Broncos. Do you think Russell Wilson comes back this season? <sighs> He's out like- for a minimum of what one game or is it two? It, was it just a concussion that he suffered? I actually didn't see mm-hmm. the latest. On it. So, yeah. I, I think, thought that it was just a concussion. I haven't seen anything outside of that. Yeah. Assuming it's just a concussion, I don't see why he wouldn't. Um, you know, it's like, should established players play in the preseason just to, like, get their rhythm back? It's almost that, but in the regular season for Russell Wilson right now. It's like, you should probably keep playing just to keep trying to find some modicum of confidence and – just consistency and rhythm in this offense because you haven't been able to really find it through 13 weeks of the season. You started to find it in the 14th week or 13th, 14th week. Um, and you know, you, you hope that it can continue. So yeah, I feel like we'll see him again. And, uh, you know, he's got to show this Broncos like organization that they shouldn't be trying to figure out what to do next at the quarterback position, that this $230 million contract isn't a complete waste because, it felt like they were super screwed for a while. And it, I mean, it still kind of does, but this is... I was going to say, it's just one game, too. Yeah, this this is at least a slight glimmer of hope, a little vote of confidence that, you know, the fan base isn't going to jump off the stadium because of how sad this team has been. And it, it's been it's been bad, for sure. Does this game make you doubt the, uh, the Chiefs at all? You know... It makes me doubt... It, it gives me the same concerns that I brought up last podcast, which was that the NFC is the the conference with all of the good defenses. The Chiefs defense hasn't blown anybody away really this year. And, and the NFC is just loaded with these strong defenses. I feel like the Chiefs will be good enough to get to the Super Bowl still because there are no great defenses really standing in their way um, in their own conference. But it does give me some concern that, you know, a, an offense that was struggling all year is throwing 60 plus yard touchdowns to Marlon Mack on you like what are we doing and and their entire Mm -hmm. receiving game is basically going through the same guy other than Marlon Mack all game which is Jerry Judy so yeah the the Chiefs defense is definitely a concern I think there's holes in that but ultimately it doesn't change too much for me in their outlook in the AFC at least can I give you a hot take absolutely the Chiefs have to figure out how to regulate Patrick Mahomes a little bit better. Everybody's still talking about him as being the MVP quarterback because he made some outrageous throws that somebody caught that ended up okay. But the man threw two interceptions and he continues to do this each week. If that crazy, what did, what did you call it? The hook shot throw? The uh, shot put. The shot put. So if that wouldn't have been okay, then we would have been talking about why would you even throw that? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what I mean by he just has these crazy talented receivers around him or tools around him that make it not as bad, but he does not protect the ball at all. And if you put that against a defense that can actually come out and shut you down, what are you going to do? It makes me actually question the Chiefs just because we've watched Patrick Mahomes do this over and over and over again, and they skid by because he also does great things. But it's almost like somebody needs to say, hey, like – we're not going to go back to last year where you're playing this hero ball and you're just making bad decisions. That's not what we're going to do. 
And I know that it's hard because the Bills do the same thing where you put all this pressure on your quarterback and you build your offense around him so much so that you're not really giving them designed runs or designed play or designed throws. You're just giving them the play and letting them read it out from there. But maybe throw in a couple of design plays, a couple of design runs, a couple of design throws because you got to they're going to have to knock Patrick Mahomes back down or else this is going to get out of control. And we're going to watch what happened last year happen again this year because it's yeah. kind of starting to repeat itself. Yeah. And, and I was actually going to mention the bills too, which you just did. Like, you know, we had this conversation about Josh Allen a couple of weeks ago where he's making these silly mistakes that we haven't seen from him in a while. And we're like, what is he doing? Well, as we sit right now, Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen now have the same number of interceptions on the year, which is 11, mm -hmm. which is good for tied. They are both tied for third in the NFL in interceptions this year. And we understand that part of that just comes from high volume passing attacks in general, but that's still not a great excuse. Um, no. The fact that they're turning the ball over this often, often, and it just furthers my belief that the Super Bowl champion is going to come out of the NFC. Or mm -hmm. if it comes out of the AFC, the Bengals are starting to look damn good with how Joe Burrow's playing. So um, I think Mahomes, with this sort of reckless play at times, he is kind of playing himself maybe out of the MVP award. I, I do enjoy how much this is going week to week with the MVP. It's just like yeah. however, however the teams play in a given week, it changes the odds and changes the favorites. But it's like mm -hmm. now people are looking at Jalen Hurts and they're like, okay, it's it's his award again because Mahomes just threw three interceptions. So I'm and with you for If sure. you look at consistency, that's the way that it should be. I mm -hmm. don't know. I just – I'm a big believer in – I think that obviously you have to work with what you have. But if I'm a coach, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, maybe we've done too much. This is what the Bills should have done. The Bills need to do these design plays as well. But help your quarterback out. It shouldn't all be on the quarterback every single play, right? It's the same thing that we're watching happen with Tom Brady. Tom Brady has no help around him. But like I said, he's having to be play caller, decision maker, all of those things. And – Though Patrick and um, wow, I am I almost just blanked on Josh Allen. I almost called him John Allen. Josh <laughs> Allen aren't doing the play calling every almost every single snap they have. It's a read, and they're having to make the decision. I just kind of feel like if we can maybe take a little bit of that pressure off, they'll be able to have a clearer mind to be able to complete the rest of the rest of the games. Yeah, and if you are filling out your MVP ballot again right now, uh, just to look at the interception totals, we got those two tied for 11, Allen and Mahomes. Jalen Hurts sitting here with a clean three. The man's thrown three picks all year. I'm giving him my vote for MVP right now. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about he has more rushing yards, doesn't he? Oh, I, I would assume so. It's Quite a bit more, that. yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, that, that's that's a lot of his game, and he's just he's probably the most dynamic quarterback in the NFL right now. The jump that he has taken this year ha has been – incredible um moving on a little bit here we had some teams that were able to exercise their demons a bit this week so the bills we touched on it they beat the jets this past week the main thing i wanted to talk about here just to give him props really quick is mike white mike Listen. white got folded like a lawn chair in this game <laughs> repeatedly i mean you've got zach wilson who i'm gonna keep mentioning it basically every show not taking responsibility for bad offense. And then you got Mike White, who's probably fighting through like two punctured lungs, broken ribs, all this stuff. He's on the ground, writhing in pain, and he still comes back in. This happened multiple times where he is just in shambles on the ground. This Bills defense did not give him a break, mm -mm. and he's still fighting. He's still keeping the Jets in it. Mike White's that guy. That's all I want to say. I just wanted to give him some props real quick. He is a tough son of a gun. He is. That <laughs> hit by um who I think it was Ed Oliver the one where he just got picked up and basically thrown yeah everybody was like um I don't know that Mike White has a rib cage after that it's no. it's shattered there's no way and then but to watch him to come back it was unbelievable you have to respect the man now and then you understand why everybody's wearing my fucking white t-shirts like I want one yeah, like the, the slow motion of that hit, it looks like when you're like wrestling a full body pillow and you like hit it with the classic WWE spear and it just completely <laughs> folds on itself. That's what Mike White looked like. I'm like, a person should not bend like that, Mike. No. Like what are you, and he comes back in the game. Zach Wilson would have been at the world's most expensive hospital before he even hit the ground on that. With play. all of his mills. Like, like, I'm sorry, Mike White is that guy. 
the fight that he showed in this game, I think, just mm-hmm. further cements his grip on this starting job the rest of the year. If we don't see Mike White start every game, barring injury, which at this point might happen, um, I will be shocked. So the other I team, think we oh, go ahead. Also have to. I just want to give credit to Dawson Knox for his Josh Allen esque yes. jump over, flip into the end zone. Um, I think that it made every. Dawson Knox fantasy owner pooped their panties a little bit, but he got the touchdown and I thought that it was amazing. I love to see it. I, I will say, I'm not sure how many Dawson Knox fantasy owners are are left out there yeah, I guess that's with how bad he's been all year. Uh, this Bill's <laughs> offense has really just been Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs. And if you mm-hmm. invest in literally anyone else on that team, good luck. Singletary had some okay weeks, but other than that, tough. Uh, but yeah, incredible, incredible play. The fact he managed to cross the goal line, while midair mid flip was was wild the other team that exercised their demons finally well player i guess joe burrow he beat the browns for the first time in his career which feels Mm -hmm. insane because i know the browns have fielded some solid teams over the past couple years with Brissett and baker Mayfield at the helm um always having a pretty solid defense but the fact that joe burrow hadn't beaten them yet is kind of crazy Finally can check that off his uh, off his checklist and say that he's beaten the Browns. It is kind of funny to me, ironic. I know it's only Deshaun Watson's second game with the Browns, but the fact that the Browns said, hey, we want to replace both Brissett and Baker Mayfield with this guy, and now they lose to Joe Burrow for the first time with this new guy, is like, well, maybe that was a mistake. Um, but no, Baker finally knocking them off. And then my favorite moment from that game that I just wanted to mention, Cade York begging the coaching staff to let him kick. It was like a 67 or 68 yard field goal. I got such a kick out of that. Not because he asked to kick it, right? Like kickers are supposed to have that confidence. Mm-hmm. He looked at that coaching staff. Like they were stupid for not letting he did. It. He and was it was like, on national television. Mean? He's like, what do you mean? Like, why wouldn't you let me kick this? They're like, Kate, that's an NFL record. That's why. And he's like, so like what? What the fuck? So I love that Cade York was basically offended that they wouldn't let him attempt an NFL record field goal. That's that's big fan now of Cade York. I loved it too. I'm also excited because Joe Shiesty's made his way back into um, MVP. Mm-hmm. I guess Absolutely. territory a little bit up from that. I was kind of confused about what happened with Higgins. I wasn't able, this game wasn't in market for me. So I basically yeah. only watched it through red zone, but he was warming up and he, played what just the first snap and that was it yeah I, i'm not sure how much he ended up playing but yeah he he did any warm-ups they didn't the bengals basically didn't say anything and then he just didn't really play from that point on so i'm curious to see how that plays out going forward but i will say i'm incredibly impressed with this offensive line they continue to improve each week um mm-hmm. and so that's that's all you can ask for yeah, and, and that's what you expect, right? Out of an offensive mm-hmm. line that adds three major new pieces in the offseason, like, and then underperforms to start. Just a chemistry thing. And it seems like it's coming together now, finally, which is nice to see. Um, yeah. We had a few games that I just want to touch on quick because they complicated what is already a complicated playoff picture. Oh so we gosh. had the Panthers at five and eight beating the Seahawks, knocking them to seven and six. We had the Jaguars, who are now five and eight, beat the Titans and knock them to seven and six. And then we had mm-hmm. this one's a little bit less so of complicating one, but the Ravens nine and four now beat the Steelers and knocked them to five and eight. Steelers were a team that we looked at as a possible playoff dark horse, not fully out of the picture yet. I mean, five and eight doesn't completely eliminate you, but it definitely makes it tougher. Um, I thought mainly these Panthers and Jags victories. It's just how much more condensed can we get with these wild card pictures? So I don't know. Weird games. You would expect a Seahawks and Titans team that is like barely over 500 to begin with. Um, take these games a little more seriously and, and come out on top over obviously inferior opponents. But mm-hmm. seems like teams are are maybe still unfocused a little bit here as the season draws draws in the closing weeks. I will say I was pretty irate getting on Twitter and seeing fans just berate Derrick Henry for fumbling, and I just kind of thought the man makes one mistake, and this is yeah. what you guys are jumping on. Okay, Twitter, like. Let's calm down a little bit. Um, man, the Ravens can't catch a break. <laughs> Their mm-hmm. backup quarterback goes down. And then you have Mitch. This is the thing that's going to set the Steelers back is if Pickens can't come back in. Pickett can't come back in. Mitch Tabriski just makes terrible decisions. Just yeah. terrible decisions. It, one of the reasons why the man was not drafted in our backup quarterback draft or even thought of. Right. Um, so that's definitely going to hurt the Steelers going forward. 
I saw a stat that there was uh there's been two instances this season where a backup quarterback has replaced a starter and then thrown three interceptions. Two instances. The first one was Kenny Pickett replacing Mitch Trubisky. And the <laughs> other one was Mitch Trubisky it's replacing Kenny Pickett. Kenny Pickett. It's the only two times it's happened all year. So <laughs> Yeah, tough, tough going for the Steelers. Um, seems like our faith in Mike Tomlin to get this team up and over 500 like he is so known to do may have been a little misplaced. This team just may be a little too far gone this year, whereas the Ravens are definitely cementing themselves in the playoffs. They currently sit atop the AFC North thanks to the tiebreaker of them uh, beating the Bengals, but we'll mm -hmm. see what the rest of the season holds. And They have I to mean, play yeah. each other again too, don't they? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, look, it, it sucks that they, you know, lost Tyler Huntley to an injury, but ultimately we don't expect Lamar to be out too long and they don't have to worry about playoff, whether they're going to make it or not. It's just going to be about, yeah. are they going to win their division or not? Um, so good, good, good things overall for the Ravens long-term they'll, they'll probably be able to sort some things out. A lot um, of gross hits this weekend. Honestly. Yeah. Oh, His absolutely. His just got demolished. Yeah. It was tough. I mean, Mike White's the poster boy, but he was not, he was far from the only one. Um, yeah. the other thing I did want to mention too, about Derek Henry, cause you mentioned him getting some <laughs> flack. I got a DM from somebody. So I assume most of the people listening to this podcast know one of the series that I do is called Bust Synonymous on TikTok and everywhere else where I make so fun good. of the players who bust in fantasy football. I got a DM from somebody who said, please put Derrick Henry in Bust Synonymous this week. I know he had 20 points, but his two fumbles cost me my game. I'm like, dude, what? That's not how that works. Like those fumbles did not cost you your game. Look up and down your lineup and find the guys that scored like six or seven. That's who cost you your game. Not the guy that just got you 20. You're just deciding and assigning blame to one player because you watched him fumble a couple of times. You're lucky he got you that 20. What are we talking about here? So I feel like we should have like a fan version of Bus Anonymous. Like, yeah, you were the dumbass fan of the week. Congratulations. Right, right. And, and, you know, I won't call him out by username, but man, I feel like I should. That's a tough one. Just try to take a step. He knows back. who he is. If you have a player that gets you 20 points, that guy is not the reason that you lost in a given no. week. So no. just just a little tough one there. Um, mm -hmm. So let's look at the actual playoff picture. We got a section here for just what the playoff picture looks like right now and who is in the mix and what we think is going to happen. So as of this recording, the Patriots and Cardinals have not played yet. Cardinals are probably not in the mix anyway. The Patriots still could be. So in the AFC, currently leading their divisions, we've got the Bills, the Ravens, the Titans, and the Chiefs. And then the current wild cards are the Dolphins, the Bengals, and the Chargers have, Chargers have the tiebreaker over the Jets. Other teams in contention, currently on the outside looking in, the Jets at 7-6, and six, the Patriots, as of this recording, at 6-6, six and six, and then we've got the Browns, the Steelers, the Jags, and the Raiders, all at 5-8. and eight. There are so many teams still in this conversation. Um, who do you think ultimately gets in? We'll, we'll just do this a little. I know we kind of ask this question every week, but it's worth asking every week because sometimes things can change and teams are getting basically eliminated. Um, who do you think snags these wild cards? Do you think any divisions are going to change? I think... The Titans one really threw me because now I'm like, can the Jags win this division? Like <laughs> we have four weeks left, you know? Yeah. Uh, this is where it starts getting tricky. Um, I do still feel like I think Washington's going to squeak in above the Giants. I think that's going to happen. They face each other this week. Um, that's going to be a telling game. The Giants are kind of beat up, especially with Saquon beat up. The AFC is where things get really tricky to me, where I, I have a hard time trying to figure out who's going to be in what. The Eagles, I feel like I pretty much can can throw out there. But it's just even like the Dolphins, I don't know what to make of them. Yeah, yeah. Th this game you know? created some questions for sure. It's funny. I, I look at the NFC and feel in. like it's more complicated. Oh, really? Yeah, and you want to know why? Because So you've got a couple of teams that are honestly three divisions that are basically locked up which is mm -hmm. the Eagles, the Vikings, and the 49ers have more or less locked up their division. Look, if the Seahawks managed to beat the Niners this week, we can have a conversation about that. But for now, it seems like those teams are shoe-ins. Yeah. The Bucks losing to the 49ers complicates things because now you've got the Falcons and the Panthers who are one game out of first place in their division. Yeah. And then with how cluttered this is, it is not impossible as we sit here on December 12th, 2022, that multiple teams from the AFC South could get into the playoffs. And I hate that. That makes me want to throw up. I hate that a lot because if the Giants keep sliding the way they have been, 
you know, these teams at five and eight, like mm-hmm. if they keep winning games, it's just, it's not out of the question. Whoever wins the AFC or the NFC South is going to be like barely 500, quite possibly under 500. And then the Seahawks losing them being one of the teams on the back end of the wild card that we figured would get in that complicates mm-hmm. it. The lions are six and seven, all these five and eight teams. I, I just don't know. I feel like we're going to get surprised with who makes the playoffs somewhere. I don't know which conference is going to happen in, but the seven seed or maybe the six and the seven seed in one or both of these conferences, it's going to be maybe a couple teams that people aren't, aren't really thinking about. Like the Packers aren't out of it. They're not. It's so wild but, to say. Well, and technically the Rams are still in it, correct? Um, the Rams Unless if, if the now. Patriots can be the Cardinals tonight, Rams are still in it or is it vice versa? So the Rams, so I don't think the Rams, the Rams are at four and nine. So that one would be, that one would be tough. The Patriots. Yeah. The Patriots though are very much in it. So there's just a lot of clutter. I mean, but if the, if the Cardinals lose tonight, they're at, they're at four and nine. Also. Cardinals would be at four and nine. Rams would be at four and nine. Um, would be tough for those. I mean, you'd have to win out. And at this point, you'd have you to win out. Yeah. We don't expect that from either of those teams. But yeah, yeah. I, I just, you know, I, I saw a graphic of it during um, the Niners game yesterday of all the teams that are five and eight that are still on the bubble. And with just how inconsistent some of these teams are playing, like like the Titans and, you know, like the uh, the Buccaneers who are playing bad. Some of these divisions aren't decided. Some of the wild cards aren't decided. Just keep these possibilities in your head because. Teams can make the playoffs that you're not expecting. And I, the Lions, I hope, get in. Um, and after that, man, no clue. It's going to be interesting for sure. It, if I had to pick right now, I would say the divisions basically hold true. Um, if the Bucks give up their division, you know what? No, I'm going to say the Falcons win the AFC or the NFC South. I don't know how. They made the change to Desmond Ritter. Screw it. I'm going to say the Falcons get it because the Bucks are doing everything they can to throw it away. At least the Falcons are making some kind of move. Too little, too late, maybe. But they're only one game out of the division. We might as well go Falcons. So I'm going to say the AFC, we get the Bills. I'm going to say the Bengals end up winning that division, but the Ravens are going to get it anyway. Titans, mm-hmm. Chiefs, then wild card would be Ravens, um, Chargers, and Dolphins. And then in the NFC, Eagles, Vikings, Falcons, 49ers. Obviously, the Cowboys will get a wild card. The Commanders, I'm going to say, get the other one, and then give me the Lions as the last one. So that's the playoff prediction right now. But I would love so that. many teams, so many teams still in contention. It's crazy. And if the Lions can keep the Packers out, even better. Yeah, absolutely. So we also, as we do every week, close out the podcast with a couple of viewer questions. So be sure to send these in. We ask the question on our uh, Instagram story on the Off the Bench uh, Instagram account. So be sure to send us your questions every week. I usually make a little post on either Sunday night or Monday morning. Just keep an eye out for it. But we have a couple. The first one being simple. Burrow MVP from Sam B. Mullen. Maddie, he's probably not the favorite right now, but I I usually do this for the viewer questions. Give me a number. Give me a percentage that Burrow wins MVP. And is he, I don't know, where, where does he stand right now as well in your MVP rankings? I think Burrow... I think Burrow should be in the conversation. I would give him a 48% chance of winning. But to me, I feel like this is Jalen Hurts award already. I I think so as well right now. 48% is a little high. 48% is pretty high. Because are you removing Mahomes from the conversation completely? Honestly, I feel like Mahomes should not. I I feel like Mahomes and – Josh Allen, I almost called him John Allen again. I don't know where that's coming from. I think that both of them should be knocked down a little bit because they're not playing, in my eyes, at an MVP level, right? Mm-hmm. I think that I think that they they are breaking their team as much as they're making their team. So it's kind of weighing them down. And I feel like without Burrow, the Bengals want to do much. I feel like he's a, a game-changing quarterback, so it should be up. But to me, this is Jalen Hurts' trophy. But, yeah, I feel like he should be – I feel like Burrow should be right up there with Mahomes and Allen. Yeah, I, I agree. It feels like it's down to kind of those four right now. It's Hurts, Mahomes, Allen, Burrow. Um, anybody else would have to make a little bit of a, a big push here in the last four weeks of the regular season. Um, Mahomes, to his credit, as much as we're like, hey, what is going on with this guy lately? Still leading the league in passing yards, leading the league in passing touchdowns. Uh, we can't throw him away just yet. Then you've got Josh Allen, who is uh, fifth in the league in passing yards and third in touchdowns. Burrow has climbed to third in passing yards, 
and touchdowns, he is second. So, and he's also got a couple less interceptions than both Mahomes and Allen, as we talked about. Jalen is a little further down the list uh, in terms of passing, just because of how much he runs the ball. But he does it so effectively that you know I think he's definitely the favorite. If I had to rank him right now, I would say probably Hurts, Mahomes, Burrow, Allen for now. Uh, but listen, Burrow has more than a viable chance of getting this. He seems to always get better as the year goes on. He just got Jamar Chase back, so. We'll see, especially if they end up winning that division over the Ravens. Um, and then the next question, why did the Falcons continue to give me all the hope in the world just to piss down their leg? This question is from Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I wanted to get this question in because the Falcons, I touched on them a little bit when we talked about playoffs, but obviously with them being on a bye, we didn't have too much to go over. Um, they named Desmond Ritter the starter. So, you know, I think there's better days ahead for the Falcons. Picking them to win the division was a little bit of a maybe a bolder take than than I would normally make for them, but it shows that they're they're trying. Um, the only thing that I'm sad about right now is that we don't get to see Kyle Pitts play with Desmond Ritter because that's what right. I really wanted to see was how much this would change Kyle Pitts' outlook, how much more Desmond Ritter looks for him than Marcus Mariota because Mariota doesn't seem to look for him, and when he does, it is an incredibly inaccurate pass. So. So I'll say this, the Falcons should have made this move probably two months ago, but look, they're making it now and they're only one game out of the division when they're doing it. So mm -hmm. they're giving you a little bit of hope. Uh, hopefully they don't piss down their leg again. And I will say this, even if they do piss down their leg again this season, I think that this should make you excited going into next season. Nobody expected anything out of the Falcons heading into this year. And I know that's where you what your point is. You're like, Hey, I didn't have any hope. You gave me hope. And then you pissed on my leg. But what I'm saying is this should make you excited for next year because them naming Ritter as a starter means, okay, we are investing in you and we're going to use you to develop. And then next year we're really going to be in the hunt, which I feel like they will be. Um, not that this season is completely out of the picture, but I feel like this should at the very least make you incredibly hopeful and excited for next season. Yeah, I mean, the offseason can bring a lot of shuffling, but if you look at this division heading into next year, there's no reason why the Falcons can't be the best team in the in the NFC South heading into next right. season. There's no reason. It's wide open, especially if Brady leaves the Bucs. But even if he stays there, we've seen how bad the Bucs have been this year. So uh, I'll say a lot of the hope you've been given, Jeremiah, is probably by the Bucs. Uh, if they had just handled their shit this year and not played awful, you wouldn't really have any hope left because – they would be, you know, four games up in the division like we thought they would be. But I want to be pissed on your leg, you'd be shit. <laughs> right. Instead, we're going to get uh, all eyes on the Falcons, I think, this week. I'm very excited yeah. to see Desmond Ritter play because uh, I, I hope he's good. I really do. I want I want better for Kyle Pitts. This is not personal between me and Mr. Pitts. I, I, just, I just want to see him do what we know he can do. And then we've got Drake London out there. Like I want to see these weapons be utilized effectively. We know Marcus Mariota can't and won't do it. Maybe Desmond Ritter can. So let's see if the, if the yeah, rookie and Maddie can pull it off. Uh, but that's going to do it for this episode. Maddie, any parting thoughts as I always ask? No, come kick it with us on Thursdays. It's been so much fun. I know that we don't always get to everybody's uh, questions. So my advice, people have been getting in there before we're even in there to ask mm -hmm. questions. So jump in there early and we'll try to get to as many as we can, but it's a good time. Yeah, we will. We will see those questions, even if you ask them when we're not live yet. So yeah, definitely you can preemptively throw some in there. It'll keep us loaded with content for the full half hour to 35 minutes that we end up being live. And mm -hmm. We actually got a pretty good game this week. Uh, I'm excited yeah. to talk about this one too and, and watch this one. You got 49er Seahawks in Seattle. Seattle's going to be kind of fighting for their lives in that division if they still have hopes of winning it because they are currently two games back of the Niners. Um, and this will do wonders for, you know, putting them only one game back and also having – have they played already this season, the Seahawks and the Niners? Um, no. They did. So the Seahawks lost to them in week, in week two. So this would, uh, you know – bring some other tiebreakers into play if they end up being one and one head to head. I believe it goes down to division record after that. So but it's a big Seahawks, one. The Seahawks didn't play them when they had CMC or Brock party. So should be exciting. Yeah. So like this, this will be game. a good one. Come hang with us on Thursday. We are live at God. What is it? Seven thirties. I'm all screwed up because I'm in mountain time, but no, you're 730 right. 730 Eastern, Eastern. 730 mm -hmm. Eastern time, 630 central time, 530 mountain time, 430 Pacific time, whatever time it is for you. If you're in England and I didn't say the time, I'm sorry. I don't know what time it is over there right now, but either that way, was incredibly impressive. Thank you. Either way, mm -hmm. come hang with us. We'll be there right before the game, the half hour before and uh, ask us your questions. But for now, for Maddie Kroll, I am Brandon Carney. This has been off the bench and we will see you guys next week.